Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cast. Borak Thung, Squat Stick Thargo, and welcome to the latest episode of the 2080 Little Cast Lockdown Tapes. Glad to have you along. I am your host, as always, Malt Char. And uh, as I said last week, uh, on this episode, we are diving back into the archive for a blast from the past. Um, Kev Walker is an artist who has uh, a, a long history with 2080 series such as uh, and- uh, Judge Anderson, uh, ABC Warriors, through to uh, Judge Dredd stories such as Mandroid. Now, back in uh, 2015, my God, uh, the podcast began as a, a complement to uh, the Judge Dredd Mega Collection, which was the part works that was launched by uh, Hachette. And um, uh, certainly for the first little while, the podcast uh, focused on uh, what was being reprinted in this hardcover series, which has now uh, come to an end and been succeeded by the 2080 Ultimate Collection. But um, at the time... Uh, the point of the podcast was to get on the artists and the writers who were, whose stories were being reprinted in this collection and uh, revisit some of these old time classics. And uh, Kev was one of our uh, earliest guests. So this episode is going to revisit that interview from 2015. <laughs> um Yes, so he he talked to me uh, about his uh, early career working on the Sylvester Stallone Judge Dredd movie and uh, Mandroid, which was the Judge Dredd story that was reprinted in the, the Mega Collection. He's one of my personal favourites as well, so uh, great to uh, listen to that again after all these very long years. Um, we'll be back for a, a normal episode next week uh, with uh, more from the current lineup of the galaxy's greatest comics so look forward to that uh in the meantime thank you to everybody who contributed to the uh just giving uh, appeal um in aid of uh, the family of dave evans the uh the fan who who sadly passed away just recently it's been great to see such an outpouring of uh of love and support um we're gonna go straight into the uh into the interview um and no outro this time. So I'll say uh, bon voyage, um, splendid verse rig, and uh, enjoy this chat from 2015 with Kev Walker. For those of you who've not listened to the Thrillcast before, we are going through the uh, first issues of the Judge Dredd Mega Collection, which is uh, a new collection available from all good news agents in the UK and Ireland, published by Hachette Partworks and 2000 AD, which aims to bring you the best Judge Dredd stories from 2000 AD and Judge Dredd Mega Zine, chronicling the the, the best adventures uh, of the lawman of the future, Joe Dredd. And now, uh, in previous episodes, we have uh, concentrated on on stories such as Shambhala with Judge Anderson, the Apocalypse War, America, one of the, the all-time seminal uh, 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 stories of, of 2018. Um, and this this week, um, we are moving on to Mandroid by John Wagner and Kev Walker with additional stories by Simon Colby and Carl Critchlow. Now, th- this is this is a bit of a dark one, uh, and uh, it, it's it's a very morally complex and, and quite challenging story. Uh, Sergeant Nate Slaughterhouse is a veteran of um, many of the campaigns uh, on alien worlds, because uh, humanity has, has moved out to the stars in Judge Dredd's world. Um, he, he is... Uh, well, um, half the man he was, quite literally, he comes back to Mega City One with uh, horrific injuries, um, and uh, half his body is replaced by cybernetic implants, um, and he becomes a mandroid, hence the, the title of the story. But discharged from the army, he returns to Mega City One and, and really does struggle along with his family to, to uh, adapt to this new existence this this slightly more mundane exi- well I say mundane um almost immediately the the uh, darker side of mega city 1 sees fresh meat 
and uh, they find themselves uh, subject to to vicious and bitter attacks from uh, the criminal underworld. The judge is uh, unable to help, but Dredd senses something within Nate's slaughterhouse. Uh, he understands perhaps the conclusion of the of, of, of the story just as it begins and uh, warns Nate not to take the law into his own hands. Uh, but it, it, it's a, uh, like I say, it's a morally complex story. Uh, Nate is, um, I think, a, a veteran that, that, that many people will, will understand, not just from fiction, but also possibly in, uh, in their own lives where, um, the injustice of, uh, daily life, uh, can really get to someone who has sacrificed, uh, so much. Now, I'm not going to spoil the story for you because it is an absolute treat and uh, probably one of John Wagner's uh, darker and uh, more intense stories. Uh, so I do encourage you to uh, to pick up um, the Judge Dead Mega Collection edition of Mandroid. It's also available from 2080online.com through our online shop. Uh, but this week, uh, I'm very pleased uh, that one of the uh, original creative team on Mandroid is here to talk to us. Joining us on the phone from Sheffield is uh, is legendary 2080 artist Kev Walker. Thanks for joining us on the 2080 Throwcast, Kev. Uh, no problem, Michelle. Um, uh, we'll, we'll crack on straight with the uh, with, with the questions. Um, Let's talk a bit about how you came to be working on 2000 AD um, in the in the first place, because your early time on the comic was inking Steve Dillon on Harlem Heroes and and Rogue Trooper uh, on Cinnabar. Um, yeah, was 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 this what what you had uh, aimed to do, or was this a case of editorial at the time um, getting new experience by walk, working alongside somebody like Steve? Um, uh, well, that that uh, that was actually what it was. Uh, I'd. Um I got my first uh, uh, try out doing a few thugs, Future Shocks, and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and uh, I think the uh, editor at the time, Richard Burton, uh, thought I needed uh, just a bit of uh, a bit of, a bit of training. I, I was you know, to do with storytelling and, right. um, and things like that, and uh, and inking uh, inking someone like Steve Dillon was probably one of the best ways to go about it mm. um, because I, I'd. Um, I'd done the first uh, uh, first few stories based, uh, uh, on the back of some illustrations I'd uh, done and sent in purely on spec, and mm. they tried me out, and uh, and I'd never really uh, tried. It was a, I'd never really tried. I could I could kind of draw, but I could never really, <laughs> I'd never really been told that, uh, that I'd shown how to uh, tell a story visually. So mm. that was the that was the important thing for him at the time. Uh, and of course, to uh, just pr practice figure work and things like that. Mm. I could draw robots like nothing, but no, no problem. But <laughs> drawing, drawing people's a different matter. <laughs> well, um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Steve Dillon being uh, the, the ideal person to to serve your apprenticeship with, because by that point he was an absolute powerhouse, wasn't he? In in, in two thousand. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what What was the What do you think was the key thing that that, that Steve taught you about storytelling, about drawing comics? Um, I, uh, well, one of the things that, uh, that is it, there's there's lots of things like the the way um, uh, you, you the the flow of panels you know from uh, close ups and um, to um, starting off with establishing shots and things like that to set your scene and. Um, just keeping uh, keeping in mind where your character is in a, in a, in in, the, in in you know like in three D space in a particular room. Mm. Uh, it's one of those things that's really really easy to forget if you if you can um, to to just forget that your your characters are actually in a in a place and unless you have them moving, there is no need for the, 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 they shouldn't be seen to be changing locations. So it, it, that, that was one of the. One of the, the weird things to get your head for me for me to get my head around at the time, uh, and because he, he was very good at establishing establishing a place and putting the people in it and actually having them act within within that uh, within that setting. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you went from uh, inking Steve Dillon um, and and uh, as you say the the future shocks, but then when you kind of had your own. Uh, uh, stab at it after this apprenticeship your your style was very radically different because up until that point you've been working in black and white and then we come on to uh, the ABC Warriors stuff in the early 90s uh, and and all of a sudden you are uh, fully painting these these glorious pages how, how, how did that happen as a, as, as a process? <laughs> um, well 
that was that was me that was me uh, um, trying to beat myself up. I, went, I actually went down. To, <laughs> uh, I, I actually went down to um, uh, uh, down to the office once with Steve. I met up with Steve. Dunn. We went down there. We were taking some uh, uh, some Harlem Heroes pages in. Yeah, and uh, we, we, we just met up because he happened to be in London at the same, uh, around at the same point at the same time. Mm. And we met up, and we were both went in, and uh, uh, the. They had some uh, some of Simon Bisley's first painted pages from uh, for Slay, slaying the Horn God, yeah, yeah, and uh, they, were, they were everybody were everybody was sort of fawning over them and uh, <laughs> going, oh look at oh look at you, know, we're not worthy, and you know, yeah. bow, bowing on bended knee, kind of thing as everybody <laughs> did, and I went. I can paint. <laughs> <laughs> I can, pa- and at this point, I'd never really picked up any. I've I, done some stuff in, in uh, painted in gouache, but not, nothing like uh, what they were asking me to. And uh, when that, uh, um, so when he actually when Richard Burton actually turned around and said, "Okay, we'll, we'll try you out," and he gave me a rug because I'd been working on, I'd been, I'd done the, the road trooper yeah. stuff with Steve, so he gave me um, uh, uh, a one off for uh, for the annual mm. uh, to try me out in paint. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I realised I didn't know what the hell I was doing, um, but it obviously it impressed him enough that I was I was I was trying really hard. So he <laughs> 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 tried me. Oh, excuse me on um, ABC Warriors, right? Because I, I mean, I, I remember uh, reading that as, as as a young as a youngster, and when 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 ABC Warriors started, uh, I, I was blown away. And obviously, I'd seen. Um, painted artwork before but it it felt so uh accomplished and so rich that i i, I think as, as as a you know as, as a kid who didn't really know how comics were produced at the time um it, it really felt as if you know you'd been doing it like that for ages but i mean that's a, that's a remarkably like i said rich, rich and complex style to just kind of suddenly launch into well um well, I mean, there's, there's two things. First of all, um, I I wasn't um, really uh, trained out in paint. Um, I wasn't really shown out of paint. Mm. Uh, when I went when I went to art college years before, I did I did graphics. So I was basically, messing around with felt tips and tracing pictures of tractors <laughs> for adverts, things like that. All of which by 1983 became completely irrelevant because <laughs> the desktop publishing uh, thing happened. You know, so yeah. like, the, the, the moment I left college, everything that I'd learned at, at college was worthless. Uh, and uh, and and for four years after that, I did packaging, which was painting fruit in gouache and right. on, on the sides of yogurt pots and. Yeah. Uh, doing um, uh, doing board games, uh, so uh, and that's, uh, um, the thing that I, uh, when I when I tackled the paint, I I had the paints and uh, I knew I, I had some of the skills, but I came from uh, a different place to Simon because what the things that I was into were um, people like Chris Foss. Ah, uh, um, right, okay. Uh, I, and uh, there's a there's a. Um, uh, Chris Moore, people like that, they were doing the, the science fiction book covers at the time. Yeah, they, they were they were kind of like, um, uh, they were kind of like my heroes at the time, mm. and I wanted to be able to paint like them. So that when it, when it came to doing that, that, especially the first episode of ABC Warriors, I had um, there was a bit of a learning curve just learning how to use a paint. Because I, uh, apart from the the like I said the the Rogue Trooper story, I'd never really used acrylics. Mm. But I'd actually found out that that's what Simon was using because oh, there's no, some of the stuff I knew that there was no way you could do it using gouache and I wanted to know what we were using. So I found out that he used a crew. So I went out and bought some and it was a learning curve. When you buy something like that new and you've never used it before, there's just a steep learning curve learning what the material can do. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea. So I was actually uh, with ABC Warriors. I knew what the, the images I wanted. I just didn't know how to arrive at me. It was a bit of a learning curve. That first book, Chronicles of Chaos, is basically me learning on the page for everybody to see. <laughs> well, it, I mean, well, well done. It, well, it's a to, remarkable learning curve. The, yeah, I managed to convince the editors at the time that I knew what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, um, yeah, I'm just making it up as I went along. Yeah, yeah. You you uh, you mentioned uh, earlier about um, uh, drawing ro- being able to draw robots really well, but but um, finding it difficult yeah. uh, with, with with people. Because uh, you went from um, ABC Warriors onto the Judge Anderson story, Childhood's End, when she she goes off to Mars 
Um, That's right, yeah. And, uh, w- and the first <laughs> episode of that, yeah, that really told me how, how little I knew how to draw people. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. By the time I got to the last sort of uh, two episodes of Anderson, things were starting to click into place. Yeah. Uh, the, the way I was painting, I think you can see there's a, the, from the beginning to the end of that. There's a big, there's a tr- quite dramatic change in the way I'm painting, mm. uh, and that certainly shows on the next book of, uh, of ABC Warriors, which uh, came out of the, the Hellbringer stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the, the reason I wanted to just um, chat about your painted stuff was because um, then when you came on to Dread uh, later. Your style had radically, yeah. radically changed again. Um, well, it, it changed a couple of times. Right. Uh, I'd, done, I'd done Balls Brothers. Yes. Uh, which was uh, um, which was kind of a, a labour of love for me. I put so much in, uh, so much into that book, yeah. into, that, into that story. It was cross ashed to you know, to the nth degree. I did every <laughs> single bit of detail you could possibly cram. I, I just wanted everything to be in there because I, I really liked the characters. I, I liked the idea of. Uh, Superheroes being idiots and <laughs> and not and, and and it was like succeeding despite themselves. Yeah, yeah. To be fair, no, nobody else really was. I, I was kind of I was, I was so depressed about that because I I'd poured everything I had into that story, mm. and cynically I just thought uh, I was I was really into Mike Mignola's work on Hellboy at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I saw that and I thought, oh hell, if he can get away with drawing very little on the page, so can I. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds cynical, but that, that, so I had, a, I, had, I had a go at it. I did a Mean Machine story, and I found that it was a lot harder than it looked. Right, yes, yeah, it, it, exactly. You actually have to design things right. You, you can't get away with hiding hiding things behind rubble, and, and which I was doing on on balls brothers. You actually have to draw. Yeah. You actually have to design, and that was well learned on the Mean Machine, and that went in went straight into. Uh, other things I was doing, uh, I did Sin City di- uh, directly before uh, Mandroid, and then and I went on to and then I went on to Mandroid. Mm. And by that time, I'd just about I'd got that style sorted out. Yeah, it, it's it's often the thing you hear from from people that uh, they describe Mignola as having a very simple style, and you think, well, you try and copy it then because it, it's it, yeah. it's actually incredibly multi layered and and uh, uh, and complex the way that he does his yeah. his pages. You can, you can draw that way because it is uh, it, it it's the experience of a lifetime being yeah. really good Absolutely. that allows him to be that simple and get away with it. Mm. Uh, and I didn't know that when I was starting out, but. I, I learned it quite quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned Sin City there, um, which is uh, going to be reprinted later in the Judge Dread Mega Collection. Um, each yeah. uh, opening page, um, uh, episode page, began with the same page layout. Yeah. I mean, do, do you like to give your stories kind of recurring visual themes and, and, and motifs? Uh, that was just one of the things I wanted to do. I, 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 I like... Um, strips that are uh, uh, well, stories that have title pages mm. or if you want to go call in graphic novel terms chapter pages yeah. <laughs> um, because you know, it, 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 it's you're starting off and if you uh, if you're starting off on a tiny little uh, tiny little sequence of panels it's kind of like you, it's, you're you're entering to the middle of something that's, uh, um, that's already been it feels like you're missing something mm. I, I, I loved all those uh, those early early dread stories um, back in the 70s when the actually uh, the the, actually had, the first panel had to have the logo in it and and I wanted to kind of hark back to that and right. that was kind of like a little homage to the to the, uh, my Mignola and Carlos Esquerra days when uh, the, you always start off with a title panel yeah um, with a, which is just kind of just scene scene setting really yeah well it it um, it's something that I, I touched on um, in the article in the back of. Um uh, a forthcoming edition of the Mega Collection, which is um, Joe Janderson, The Possessed, which was drawn by Brett Ewins. And yeah. you, you you notice that the, the, the cliffhanger image of each episode is the, pretty much the same as the as the opening uh, image of, yeah. the, of the following episode. And it's kind of like this really heightened moment, like this blockbuster kind of, ta-da! You know, keep you on tenterhooks for, for, for a week. And then you come back yeah. in and you go back into the story. And it, it, that's, that's a really, well, it's particularly when you're dealing with weekly comics, that's a really effective storytelling technique. Yeah. 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 
Um, well, I mean, well, one of the, the other things about Sin City was as well is that uh, John was actually writing that uh, as I was drawing it. Right. Um, so he, he uh, although he had he had the you know the the main story arc in his mind, the actual details of how you're going to get from not, not from A to Z, but from A to B, C to D, mm. all the way down. He, he was he was he was tinkering with that as he was going along, and he was he was writing a stri- uh, an episode based on the one I'd done sort of like two weeks before or whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, and, and he actually did say that if it, it would have been a different story if it was going to draw it. Yeah. Um, they would have done things differently. Mm. Uh, and, and maybe, I don't, I don't want to uh, put words in John's mouth at all, but uh, maybe that was one of the things that he worked into Mandroid, because when I got Mandroid, that story was so thoroughly worked out from beginning to end that yeah. I could just go away with it. And, and I knew where I was going. The, the, the uh, I, I knew what I was building up to so that I could allude to lots of things when I was uh, when I was doing the early early pages. Mm. Well, you, you've worked almost exclusively with with John Wagner on your Dread stories for for, for two thousand yeah. AD. Do you think John's scripts bring out your your best work? What is what is it about them that you enjoy? I, I think John's just a very very good uh, writer for an artist because mm. he does he just tells tells the story and lets the artist do their thing. Um, there's, he doesn't bother himself so much with uh, camera angles and, um, and and the and the amount of dialogue he's like is ca- sometimes kind of loose because he, he knows he can go back and tweak it, you know, uh, add things or take things away if he, if he needs more room um, as he wants. So it, it, he's just he's just a really easy person to work with, mm. um, and that. Oh, again, that comes from experience as well. Yeah. Uh, knowing, uh, just been um, uh, not so um, uh, uh, precious over the work that you can't allow someone else to do their thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's kind of like the way, we, we, um, as an artist, I, I have to be with to allow the, uh, another colorist to come along and uh, colour. Although I, with uh, Sin City and, and Mandroid, I was colouring myself. But on other things, I've I have to allow uh, a colorist to to do their thing as well. Yeah, we we do hear that a lot from artists is, is is how much they enjoy working with John just because of the freedom and the trust yeah. that, that that's placed in them to kind of say, well, well, here's here's the bare bones, here's the script. You go away and play with it, and you know it's it, it's it's kind of um, it, it's it's a test almost to how that artist is going to react to that because um, you know some people kind of look at it and go, well, what am I meant to do? Whereas well, I kind of I think it kind of depends on the uh, on um, it depends on the the artist as well. I think there's because I had I had worked uh, on when it came to my my dread work and it's worked exclusively with John. It it he probably kind of knew what he was gonna, by the time I got to Mandroid, he knew what he was going to get from me, so he knew that he could just leave um, leave certain things alone. It didn't have to um, you know um, tell me whether it was a high angle or. Mm. You know, unless it was actually for a specific, a specific plot point that he wanted to get across, um, no, it just it just it lead me to it, and I think that was just just that just came from having worked to work together for um, for a couple of very big stories. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we've we've kind of skirted around Mandroid a little bit, but let's let's kind of plunge yeah. into that. It's I, I, it's an incredibly dark and 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 uncompromising storyline uh about nate slaughterhouse yeah. and his his family um how did how did you feel about the story when you when you first got those scripts um i i it was just one of the uh uh it just reminded me of one of those um the, the thing about john is he's brilliant absolutely brilliant at doing pathos yeah he can get he, he, he can get to the kernel so if something is uh, uh, he, he can write the saddest story imaginable, can John? Mm. Um, he can also write the most lunatic stories as well. But I don't think, like it. Like a lot of writers can't do can't do sadness like that. And he's kind of like that, that kind of desperate. I mean, there's a guy who loses absolutely everything. He loses his family. He loses half his body, mm. and he ends up in prison at the end of it. <laughs> I mean, if, if ever there, if, if, if he ends up in a cube, if ever there was a man who like, okay, we'll let you go. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they deserve that kind of, well, I'll just turn a blind eye you because you've just wiped out all the bad guys. Yeah. He deserved it, but he still ends up, still, by the end of my story, he ends up in prison. And he's kind of like, it's just like, uh, if, that's one of those uh, things where you, you, you know you're rooting for the, you're rooting for the guy who's uh, you're rooting for the bad guy essentially. Yeah. And and um, in terms of of uh, how you reacted to that story through your art, do do you, do you feel that um, that that pathos, that 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 darkness, that that um, difficult moral situation? How how did yeah. you rise to that? Um. Well, I actually, I, I made a, I, it was a, it was a very, because the story felt very, very hard. I wanted the line work to be very hard as mm. well, because it was a very grim, cold, um, black and white story. Uh, there was, I did even less shading and, and texture in that than, than I had done previously. Mm. And I, I went to, I actually used repeatographs on that, the, the, the steel pointed pens rather than felt tips. Oh, right, okay. And, 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 and I, drew it on, I drew it on the really thick tracing paper because it's a really hard surface to draw on. Yeah. Uh, and I still got, I think I've still got most of those pages somewhere. Right. Um, and so I, I penciled it on uh, on a separate sheet and then just traced it through for the uh, for the line work um, just to get that, uh, that really hard, um, also, I, it's, it's just the, the the, like the concrete edge feel to it. Um, yeah. It's all clean and uh, and and, um, and cold. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a hard thing to go, but that's just where it felt like it needed it needed to make us the. Uh, I mean, the the, 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 the scene where um, uh, Nate Slaughterhouse uh, loses his son, mm. uh, which because it's, it's the cliffhanger of, the, of of an episode, and goes it goes over goes over, goes over the, the beginning the end of one episode, the beginning of another. And that I, th- I, st- I still think that's one of the best scenes I've ever I've ever drawn. Right. Um, because um, uh, I actually I just I, mean, I, I just I actually found myself crying while I was drawing it. Oh. Wow. Um, and and I was just thinking, geez, I, I didn't really realise that I could do something like that. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that was probably because um, uh, I um, uh, I think uh, at the time I. I um, I'd become a, a father, so that's probably why I uh, why I, I did that. Mm. Um, but that was actually a really hard story to draw. So that that part of it, anyway. Because mm. I, I find rereading it that um, you you are very quickly drawn into the situation that the the slaughterhouses are, are, are in. This kind of dizzying, confusing situation that they are they're never ahead of. You know, it, as soon as yeah, one thing happens, something compl- else. Yeah. Everything is completely out of their control. It doesn't yeah. matter what they do; uh, things things just spiral out of control, and there is nothing they can do about it. Mm. It's kind of uh, it's like being in the middle of a uh, being in the middle of a riot. Yeah. You you uh, it doesn't matter what you do; everything's out of your control, mm. and it's just about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and when you think about it, a lot of, uh, John writes a lot of things like that, going back, all the way back to the early days is um, that when Steve Dillon did uh, he did a story which was uh, Alone in the Crowd, mm. Mm. Um, which was just, it was just a one-off story about people not wanting to be distracted while someone else is um, is being mugged on a on a city street and. Everybody else turning a blind eye, and that's one of the recurring things that John writes about: uh, how um, it's such a, a massive place is Mega City, and with so many people, yet every single person that lives there is alone, mm. and um, and never gets any help, even from the people that are supposed to give them help. Yeah, we, we we've talked on the on the Thrillcast before about the moral ambiguity uh, inherent in Dread, and how uh, John has really played up. Uh, the elements of, of, of that ambiguity over, over, over the years. And as you say, Mandroid is such a difficult story because under any other writer, you would end up with uh, everything being okay. You know, may, maybe um, Nate, uh, Nate's wife uh, it isn't quite the same, but Nate's okay, you know, and yes, life's going to be difficult, um, but we're going to get yeah. through it together. And and John just doesn't pull that punch at all. He He destroys... This poor man who's done nothing but want to 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 to, to live in in peace and and all the way through, dread is sympathetic, but that's right, yeah, but harsh. 
Yeah. And I think it would have been it's uh, uh, would have been very easy. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm I'm quite sure that um, John knew there was going to be another story, which because he, uh, he could quite easily have just um, just finished it there and then and killed Nate yeah. Slaughterhouse off. Mm. But there was more to, more to be told because there were still a few open threads, like you know what were, what are you going to do with his wife? Because she's basically like a, a robot vegetable. Mm. Because um, she's had a a, a, um, a brain messed about with at the end, so she doesn't basically do, she's she's not in there anymore. Um, and I think there was still some other the whole the whole um, war veterans thing was um, um, you know what do you do when you've been trained to fight and you're not allowed to mm. do the thing that you've been trained to? I think that all those questions were there to be answered, which is why I think there was. Um, and it was. A sh- I, I actually wanted to do uh, the sequel as well. Um, uh, I just. I think at the time when, uh, when I got the call saying, "Well, we want to do Mandroid 2, I just accepted a big job from either Marvel or DC at the time, so right. there was just no way I could do it. Mm. Let's talk about your, your, your colouring on uh, on Mandroid because I, I I think it's probably. As distinctive as the style in which you're you're, you're drawing um, the, the 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 strip in with uh, yeah. pencils and inks, um, how do you settle on uh, a colour palette for something like Mandroid? Because everything felt very dour, very dirty. Yeah, um, and, and well, that was me trying to um, uh, yeah, you got to try and tell the, the emotions of the story through uh, uh, because you don't have. Uh, you don't have sound and music and um, whatever. You just all you've got is lines and colour. Mm. Uh, so you've got to, you've got to use the colour to give the um, the story its emotional pitch. And if everything's bleak, then you've got to have bleak colours. So there's no point in making it all nice and jolly if it's one of the, um, one of, uh, the you know the really sad part of the story. Mm. Um, the the colour is there to tell the emotions of the characters, not just you know concrete grey, skies blue, things like that. It, yeah. That's not what it's there for. The colours of the the colours of the city and you know Mega City One should uh, are there to reflect the people in it. Um, and if they're having they're having a happy happy time, the colour the colours of the city and the and, and everything around them are, are happy. And if they're not, then the colours aren't. Mm. Uh, and actually, that's, that's kind of my that's kind of my philosophy for uh, the way comics should be coloured. Anyway, right. I think if you always if, if you always if you always start um, if you start with all, uh, using every crayon in the in the box uh, the, from the beginning, you've nowhere to go. Mm. You've no um, you've got you've got to be able to build up to your big explosion because if you start off with those colours, nobody's going to notice it by the time you get to the end because it'll be drowned out by all the previous scenes. Mm. So you've got to if, if you're building up to a climax, you've got to start off bleak so that the bright colours will um, uh, will show that um, that acceleration in tone. Mm. Mm. It, it's it's interesting with colouring that that uh, it's it's kind of one of those uh, not forgotten but kind of passed over arts where where it if, 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 it it's, if it's working, you 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 don't notice it. You know, that's right. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very very underrated thing, and so little is. Um, Colour is kind of like an afterthought mm-hmm. um, for uh, for a lot of comics, and it can either it can either elevate or completely ruin a piece of piece of line work. Mm. Um, it is, it's it's the thing that people tend not to notice quite as much, and people who do it a lot over uh, um, just the colouring over um, people like Chris Bly tend to um, can sometimes be maligned, but the, like, they they turn colours out. Um, Every day, mm-hmm. and sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. Yeah, uh, more often than not, yeah, um, people like Chris Blythe get it right. Uh, he's a very good colorist, and they do it on such a small uh, page rate that the fact that there's any color on there should be applauded. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, but you know, it, it's part of the uh, part of the way comic uh, the, the way comics is, is uh, uh, works. If they if the the margins were better, if the people bought more comics, then maybe they could pay um, pay more for certain things like lettering and colouring, and mm. because lettering is another place where it can, can completely ruined. And you know, the, the number of times where I've um, 
and it happened, happens actually um, at a couple of places in the Dread story that uh, that's already been published, the origin story. Yeah, uh, is that a speech bubble ends up, a speech balloon ends up being placed directly over the thing that people are talking about, <laughs> so you can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, well, I left that space to the left of the character <laughs> for the speech balloon, and you put it on the right where the the thing is talking about yeah, it. Yeah. And uh, it's like uh, yeah, little things, and it completely spoils the flow of the story. Mm. Um, and the the putting a comic strip together is so much a a, 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 a collaboration of uh, people that um, the person who's reading it sometimes forgets that. This, you know, you've got, it's not just the, the editorial staff and and everything um, uh, else as well. That if all those people, you know, if something just doesn't gel quite together, then the story's read, but they don't they don't see them. They just go, oh, that's not a good strip, or that's a bad strip. Mm. But, um, and you know, it works, and they don't realize, really understand why. Mm. And it is sort of, it's quite often little things that can ruin a story. Um, Let's uh, let's let's talk about the one time that, that you've uh, you wrote and illustrated uh, a comic strip, which which was the Inspector, um, yeah. which was uh, is, is going to be coming up in um, volume seventeen of of the, of the Mega Collection. Oh, what, that's going to be it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, why did you want to, to to make the leap into into scripting, and 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 did did you find it more fulfilling, or was it more complex, or? Um. Uh, writing is one of those um, the things that I, I still want to do. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, I'm a better drawer than I am a writer. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, the, the writing is actually um, um, harder. Mm. So um, uh, I'll leave, uh, nowadays mostly I'll leave it to other people. Um, I... I um, the, I wanted to. I wanted to. Uh, I just have because, because I, I'd always. I, I wanted to be a writer as well. I had the creative urge. I wanted to. I wanted to create something of my own. Mm. Um, that was it. It was just like the. It was the creative impulse. That's all it was. That's why. That's why I created the character. Came with the character. Mm. Um, it was just an idea I had, and I pitched it. And um, I think it was Dave Bishop at the time. Uh, said yes. Right. Go ahead and write it up, mm. and it was well, it wasn't um, it wasn't an easy thing. I, I worked in I worked in collaboration with an, an, another guy called Jim Campbell, um, uh, and he he helped me put the uh, I had the, the story ideas, but not the the practical experience to be able to put the put it actually lay it all out mm. and, and work the story out. Um, but it has stood me in good, 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 stead, uh, good stead, and I think uh, 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 every uh, every artist should actually uh, certainly have a go at writing their own stories, mm. because it helps you understand the structure of the thing that you're putting together, what the what the beat points are, and um, uh, the where the highs and lows um, go in, uh, where the, the story works structurally. Mm. Um, and you should certainly have a go putting that together because actually doing that from coming, starting with starting with nothing, not even uh, and and actually creating the story and then drawing it, it's a different beast altogether than what it is when you're just taking someone else's story because so much of it then is already is already laid out for you. Mm. Okay, um, tell us uh, something of your experience working on the 1995. Stallone, Judge Dredd film. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Argu argument time. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, uh, I was, uh, uh, it was meant to be, I was meant to be working two weeks uh, and it had been three months. Right. Uh, and I was there basically to, well, it started off, I was there to sell the concept of the, of the film. Mm. You know, just the, the high point, the way the film was kind of going to look. Most of the work I did was uh, uh, ended up not being in the film, but would uh, give the flavour for all um, for all the other uh, artists right. I was working on. And it was also to sell uh, to sell a lot of the ideas that um, uh, Danny Cannon, the director, had that he wanted to sell to the 
uh, he wanted to sell the producers on. Mm. And it was an especially difficult... And, and, and this is kind of going back to the comics thing where, where you've got lots of contributors. Producing that film was a lot harder than a lot of people realise because mm. there were essentially five producers on that film. Wow. And, and, uh, and I, I spoke to uh, most of them briefly uh, in, in, some res- in some cases. But the... Um, uh, every single one of those producers who were convinced they were, were, were told me what that they were making, uh, what kind of film they were making, right. and each one had a different idea of the film they were making. <laughs> so the fact that it even got fin- got it got even got to actually actually filming mm. uh, uh, was a, a minor was a minor miracle really. Right. And uh, I think Danny Cannon did the best he could at the time mm. with the people. Uh, I mean, because he, he he can put a story together. I mean, he he was. Uh, the, um, as a director, he's uh, um, pretty much right up there on, as far as TV is concerned. He was yeah. one, uh, one of the creating um, uh, starting directors on CSI. He created created the franchise. He started off Gotham, um, uh, the, the recent Batman um, mm. prequel thing. Um, so he knows how to put a, put a story together. Um, I just think that it, it was it's when you. Trying to bring so many elements that are um, working together, you, you, you're you're fighting a hard battle. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I, I think uh, the Stallone movie is often uh, maligned. I know I've I've done it many a time um, because uh, uh, because of various elements. You know, the helmets came off. There was a kiss at the end, etc., yeah. etc. It but, is much 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 maligned. Yes. Yeah, uh, and uh, it, it's it's. I think it's it's telling that that for, for for all of the criticism of the of, of the Stallone film, you know, there there were two thousand AD artists like yourself and 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 Chris Cunningham as well was was, was yeah. involved. You know, you, you you were the guys who knew what you you were about. You know what you were doing. Um, yeah. You know how things were, were were meant to look. And I think a, a lot of times people don't realise that that um, people who worked on two thousand AD were directly involved in in the look of the film. Yeah, yes, uh, we, we were all there, and we were all doing our thing. We were fighting for, for tooth and nail to get the. And you know, uh, when I when I was, um, uh, I was uh, listening in on conversa- on script rewriting conversations. Mm. I let out a, a, a cry of horror when they said that um, that Dread was going to kiss her, she or her she was going to kiss Dread. I was, <laughs> no, you can't do that. <laughs> and the editor, to his cre- uh, the director, to his credit, he walked past me and went. Kev, I don't want to hear it, shaking his head because he didn't want it either. But right. you know, there are certain things that are required of a blockbuster, <laughs> or, or they were at the time. And yeah. the argument was that everybody, everybody knew what Stallone looked like mm. because you know stars were, were stars. We hadn't had films like um, uh, V for Vendetta, where a big name star will actually leave a, fa- a mask over his face yeah. for the entire time. This was, these were the days when it was the star that, that sold the film. And the thing is that if it hadn't had someone like Stallone, it wouldn't have got the budget, so it wouldn't have been made. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, it was a sword, it was a double-edged sword. Yeah. And there was, there was some things were going to happen right, some things were going to happen wrong. And it was kind of, it was a toss-up as to whether it was going to work. And I think there was, there's as much works in the film as doesn't. Mm. Um, I think the, the, the other scenes that, that you can see that I, I still have uh, um, had a finger in, which is to do with the robot and, and, the, and the way the city looks, yeah. I'm quite happy to say that they still look great. <laughs> when it comes to the Dread outfit, I had nothing to do with the, with the dread, dread uniform. <laughs> uh, I had nothing to do with the clones. I had yeah. nothing to do. And that's another thing that a lot of people don't realise as well. The, 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 the scene in the Dread film where the cl- uh, 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 they're, they're talking about clones, and then all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, everything seems to be exploding. Yeah, uh, that's because they um, they wanted they had to edit the film to be able to get the PG thirteen uh, rating. Mm. At the time, the, the apparently at the time, um, but um, the, uh, the American senator Bob Dole was really big on uh, gun. Um, uh, abuse in in movies, yeah, uh, and, and so although um, other films were very very similar, because this was being aimed at um, 
at mine, at sort of, you know, young teens, you know, young to mid-teens, yeah. the age group, uh, the the gunplay, especially because uh, lots of, all the scenes were filmed with them um, shooting clones, mm. uh, and they couldn't use they, they they edited them out because they were because they were told to, to get the the low, certi- the, the low certificate. Right. They still didn't get the low certificate, <laughs> and they couldn't put the, and they couldn't put the footage back in. <laughs> so somewhere somewhere uh, in the production company. It vaults there. Uh, all of those scenes are sitting there, waiting to be put back in a proper director's cut, <laughs> and it will never happen. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's 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 a shame. I, I think uh, even even when I was, uh, uh, how old was I? In uh, I think I was sort of fifteen, sixteen at the time. I I I thought, where where have the clones gone? Why, you, you, as yeah. you say, why is everything exploding all of a sudden? Very bizarre. So because Very bizarre. Of lots of so because, lot, because lots of things got deleted, mm. um, you're left with lots of times that dreads being saved from being shot in the back. Right. Uh, which everybody goes, that doesn't make any sense. That would never happen to dread. But that's because all the other stuff that was taken out yeah. made it look like that that's what, all, the, the only bit of story that was left. <laughs> so it, it's a, it, it was basically butchered, butchered before and after. Right, right. Um, but everybody working on it had you know, all the best intentions. Even, even Stallone himself mm. had the best of intentions. But sometimes things just don't work, no matter how much money you throw at them. Absolutely, absolutely. So obviously, you, you've, a lot of your career has been spent uh, working on on uh, uh, on Judge Dredd uh, as a as a character. Any plans to to, to come back and do more for two thousand eighty? I'd love to come back and do some more. Mm. Um, uh, I have uh, I'm on I'm on contract with Marvel, and I'm. Oh, well, I look at it, I'm kind of spreading 2000 AD ness to the Americans. So <laughs> I, I try to do, I try to do uh, everything. Uh, all the characters are, 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 tend to be a little um, uh, non superhero. Not, not, nobody wears spandex when, when I draw them. <laughs> uh, they, they, all, they all wear proper, uh, pro- proper clothing, and uh, they, they have, uh, the, the girls are proper shapes. I, I, I try to I try to spread that kind of design, um, uh, 2000 AD design ethic of uh, mm. you know, big guns and bikes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there, there is that, well, that character you had uh, a little while ago who who looked an awful lot like uh, uh, yeah, Joe Dredd. Yeah, that was intentional. Yeah, well, yeah. When I, when I started work on, on uh, Thunderbolts, because uh, the, the writer, uh, um, uh, Jeff, uh, said he wanted... Um, he asked me what I wanted to do, and I gave him a long list of the things that I would like to see in there, and uh, bless him, he actually put most of them in there. Right. And uh, one of his suggestions was because he wanted to put some, he actually wanted to put Judge Dredd, he, he would have done a, a proper team up and got Dredd in there if he could have done. Mm. But we ended, it ended up being a pale homage to, to Judge <laughs> Dredd rather than... <laughs> Uh, rather than uh, the actual character himself, yeah. I had to do. I had to do several designs, you know, taking and and each design. It, it started off being quite a lot like Dread, and ended up being very little like Dread. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kept. I kept the. I managed to keep the grimace. And that was about it. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. It, it did. It didn't go unnoticed uh, amongst our our readership. I think uh, a lot yeah. of people pointed it out. But no, that's great. Um, well, that was intended from the very start of my, <laughs> me working on that on that book. I, I had to wait two years to get to that. Right, blimey, blimey. So, uh, Kev, I, I, we've run out of time. So, thanks very much indeed for joining us on the 2008 Thrillcast. No problem, any time. Brilliant. Thanks again. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.